I keep coming across important, critical pieces of research that are published too late. They're published at a time where people can just look back and say, gosh, if only we had known. And I'm going to be sharing with you the story as to what happened with this important paper. And there's a reason why I say it's so, so critical. And it took four years for it to be published. That's what's unbelievable. It's going to be about chest computed tomography, CT, and plain radiographs demonstrating vascular distribution and characteristics in COVID-19 lung disease a pulmonary vasculopathy. And this was only just published in the Ulster um, Journal in the past maybe week, week and a half. And I came across it because of uh, an X feed where the radiologist was talking about his experience. The more I am looking at the reality with regards to the science, the more I'm coming to the conclusion that the critical pieces of information that were needed to guide the scientific thinking were largely either blocked, suppressed, or deliberately ignored. And I look back now at this paper, I wish I had seen that in late 2020 because it fit exactly with my prediction and at that time my prediction was based on the science it was an a hypothesis it was already submitted to frontiers and it was eventually accepted again the point of autoimmunity against ace2 and at that time in 2020 2021 a lot of people just did not get it they thought why are you talking about autoimmunity what in the world relevance does this have in terms of severe COVID-19? It's clearly a viral pneumonia. And my point was that, no, it's like a lung vasculitis. And that's why certain drugs didn't work very well. And other drugs that you wouldn't expect to work very well did an extremely good job. And so you realize that if there was better understanding of what was going on, how many lives could have been saved? And I spoke with Dr. Shetty yesterday and his approach technically was utilizing the principle of immune suppression rather than antivirals and literally zero of his patients died. Can you imagine if that had been implemented across the world? But here is the problem. Was this information suppressed because it could have damaged the narrative and the subsequent plan for rollouts in 2021? Because if you accepted that this was primarily a vascular disease, you would have to look at vasculitis as being the primary pathology. And vasculitis just means inflammation of the blood vessels. And if you looked at vasculitis as the primary pathology, who in their right mind would try and stimulate the immune system again? That was my point from 2020. If you understand the disease, you would be extremely cautious about stimulating the immune system. If you are interested in looking at that, as I have shared before, I've put together the advanced course at a huge discount now, simply because it's just so important. This has almost 60 modules in it, breaking down every aspect of COVID-19. And I did it because I didn't want to forget all the research that had been done over that period of time. And this is accessible for people who want to understand the science and the research. And the point, though, is that I'm going to take you through step by step with this paper. But in it, I will show you why, if this paper had been published and had been acknowledged in late 2020 into 2021, 
it could have changed the direction of the pandemic. That would have been my hope, but you never know. Let's look and see what it is that he said. Here is a specific doctor. It was Dr. Graham Lloyd-Jones who did the paper. And this is on his X feed in the past day or so. In 2020, if you had told me it would take until April 2021 to get his research published, he'd have been disappointed. But it took until April 2025, four years later, to get this research published. And he is just detailing this journey that he had, what he called a COVID-19 failure story. And he shows here an image of a patient's chest. These are the lungs here. This is the heart in the middle. And all of this is the inflammation that was occurring in the lungs. He went on to say, he highlighted who he was. Now, this guy has set up a whole system about radiology. So uh, a professional radiologist by trade, he has developed a radiology masterclass, which helps to train doctors across the world. And he took the time to do the research, looking at scans, because that's what he does. And so in early 2020, he was trying to teach doctors about how to make a diagnosis on a chest x-ray or a CT scan. And as he said, the diagnosis was easy because the, the pattern on the x-ray was so unusual. This is what it would tend to look like in COVID. So much so that you could do an x-ray and know, even if the person was negative for COVID, that this person had COVID because it had such a clear x-ray pattern. And this is what he noticed as well. And as he pointed out, the early papers in China also showed distinct patterns of lung damage. And he has some images here to show you wherever you see this whitish, grayish area, black means a lot of air, grayish and white means other things, consolidation, and bright white usually means blood vessels because they have, um, they have contrast in them. And so he was looking at the the, the scans from China, and he was curious as to why COVID-19 caused this weird pneumonia. Now, remember, he's a radiologist, so he's looking at x-rays all the time. And I think that's a very reasonable question. And so the areas of damage in COVID, he said, looked like what we see when someone has clots in their lungs. And so this is what he thought at the time. And he shows here an image of a patient. These are what you call wedge-shaped infarcts, where if the blood vessel higher up is blocked, it will then prevent blood from going to a triangular section of the lung. And this pattern is what he was seeing. And then when the autopsy papers started to show clotting in the lungs, in the small blood vessels, it made perfect sense. And as I said, you're starting to see the pattern here. So he was looking at the radiology images and he was saying, this is fitting not with a pneumonia, but with vascular disease or vascular damage. How in the world does that make sense? And it could explain why it had such an unusual and severe presentation. And he went on, he said, he then raised an alert in June of 2020 and he said in his letter, acute COVID-19 lung disease, a pulmonary lung vasculopathy, not a pneumonia. However, he was told it would be too time consuming to be put forward as a publication. So he then started to share his findings informally in his masterclass on his online pattern. Then he got invited to speak at a conference highlighting this is not a pneumonia, this is a disease of the lung blood vessels. And then he got involved in everything else. And he was highlighting that unlike influenza, there is no inflammation in the lung airways in people with severe COVID-19. It was the blood vessels that were damaged. And yet the world of medicine carried on treating it as if it were a flu. Oh my goodness. I mean, if that paper had been published in 2020, because I was saying this is autoimmune. This is, and so this is now where I'm extrapolating from what he did. 
So I'm taking it beyond what he was finding into what I think was the explanation for what was going on. So this is taken from the Advanced 360, one of the, the sections, one of the, um, the, the 60 modules in, involved in it. But here is what I was then looking at in terms of the, um, in terms of looking at the severity of COVID-19. So follow along in terms of the pathophysiology here. In this, I've got x-ray comparisons. This is COVID compared to a pneumonia. So you can see the pneumonia tends to, it's whitish in one side of the lung mainly. And this is a normal chest x-ray. This is the heart here. And these are the, um, the vertebra. And this is the lungs. The lungs usually looks dark because it's full of air. So whenever it looks whitish, it's because it has either fluid or um, um, material stuck in it. And so therefore it, the x-ray can't go through it quite well. And so you can see in the COVID pneumonia, it's whitish on both sides. And this is a typical pattern that you would see with COVID, severe COVID. And again, highlighting these bilateral infiltrates in the lungs with minimal symptoms sometimes. And as, I, as he said, it was so characteristic that you could just see this x-ray, know the patient had COVID even without them being tested. And it was likely to be some inflammation and consolidation secondary to microclots. That's what I was saying then. So here is the breakdown as to how it works. These little microclots would then block a small blood vessel, preventing blood from being able to pass beyond it and get oxygen. And in this case, this is how I drew it out. These are from the bigger arteries, going down to the branch arteries, down to the arterioles, down to the capillaries. And it's in the small blood vessels that you would have these blockages. So this represents blood coming this way. It's blocked with a microclot because the blood vessels are getting smaller and smaller. And so now you can't get blood down here. And simply because of the way how the lungs get their blood supply from the center and spread out, the, wherever you have a clot, if it's a major artery, you will then have a big wedge in the lung. If it's smaller, it's a smaller wedge. And these are what we call wedge-shaped infarcts because the lungs are damaged in that way because of the blood vessels, blood clots. And the important thing to understand is that it's not just about the fact that you have a few blood clots in severe COVID. I've explained to people that in order for someone to die who has had severe COVID-19, you effectively, even on a ventilator, giving them 100% oxygen, you can't get them to breathe. And that's because all of these blood vessels would have killed off the ability of oxygen to get in the blood. And this is how I, I use that description. In effect, if all of these were functional in a normal person, they would just breathe normally. They could run a marathon. If you take away 80% of them, they would feel short of breath and they would be struggling and probably need a bit of oxygen. Where you would find that even on a ventilator they wouldn't survive is if you took out about 90% of them with the blockage to these blood vessels. And these microclots would have had a huge impact on the severity of the disease. So fundamentally, people didn't die of severe COVID-19 because of lung inflammation. They died because blood could not get into the alveoli to get oxygen. It's as simple as that. And this is such an important point. And as I said, in the context of the severe disease, this piece of research would have fit perfectly in terms of what they were saying. And so their research showing you what had happened in terms of, as I said here, when they looked at the plain radiographs and the CT chests, they were finding that it was primarily the lungs that were damaged. And it wasn't a big study. It was about 40 participants as they were looking at it. But what they found is that there was lung damage it was found in all the subjects. However, airway inflammation was only present in about 23%. 
and limited to small areas. That's not enough to cause somebody to die. Remember, you almost need to lose 80 to 90% of your lung capacity before you can't get oxygen in. And they noted vascular abnormalities were dominant, characterized by dilated peripheral pulmonary vessels supplying areas of lung damage in a gravity-dependent distribution bilaterally in 95% of the cases. This was a lung blood vessel disease, not a pneumonia. As I said, if, if you understand that, because the next obvious question should be, if it is not the lung airways that are being damaged primarily, if it is just the blood vessels where the majority of blood vessels are being damaged, that fits in with what we call a vasculitis. Inflammation by the virus, not necessarily by the virus, inflammation by the virus triggering an autoimmune response, which then damages these blood vessels. This is what we predicted in 2020. This is, this is what we said. Finally, I think people are starting to get a better idea about what it is. It was autoimmunity. That's all we said. The ACE2, the virus, because ACE2 was binding to the viral spike protein, it was triggering autoantibodies, and that's why it targeted the lungs, because that's where the highest concentration of ACE2 is located in the bloodstream. Damages the kidneys as well, damages the heart, damages the brain. When you look back at it, it, it appears perfectly obvious. But what we needed was the research. It seemed that that research didn't fit the narrative. Because, as I said, if you think that this is a vasculitis, nobody in their right mind would go and put the thing that is potentially triggering the vasculitis <laughs> in somebody else. You just wouldn't do that. And so that information would have been inconvenient. And my worry is that the people who should have known better opted to gamble. Now, it would be okay. It was a gamble. Because if you understood this, it, it should never have been a gamble. I, it should have been, as I, as I said, the only people who should have been targeted were the very high risk, who hadn't yet had an infection. And in that situation, because the disease was so severe, you could probably justify a gamble. But when you understand the pathology, it is no surprise that this is such a serious problem that we are now facing. So you have to remember now, when you understand why that occurs, you will see why I'm so worried. Because the same virus that triggers these kinds of autoimmune responses is still circulating, getting into people's bloodstream, and triggering all kinds of unusual responses. Now we have a problem with the fact that they still don't want to know. Will we be able to get to the facts and the truth? Because it determines what kind of treatment can be used to protect the health and well-being of the population. This is one of those times where we can only hope that the focus gets back to patients and not to finances. Have a great evening.